So uh, the first week we talked about gossip. Then last week, Pastor John led us through Jesus' teaching against religiosity, and today we are tackling judgmentalism. See, we judge one another all the time for all sorts of reasons, don't we? You can be judged for what you do for a living, what you wear, what you eat or don't eat, um, where you're from. You ever been judged by somebody because you, you reminded them somehow of someone else, right? Like, it, there's no rhyme or reason sometimes to our judgment. It's bad enough that we judge others for some choices that they make without taking into consideration everything that went into that difficult choice, but we judge people for things that they have absolutely no control over. And so we know that judgmentalism is a problem in part because at some point or another, we've all experienced firsthand what it is to be judged, right? It's that, it's that punched in the gut feeling of hearing your name come up and realizing people are talking about you behind your back. And you're hearing what they're saying, how they misunderstand you, how they're mislabeling you. And whether it's getting the cold shoulder or the dismissive glance, a lot of us like to pretend like we couldn't care less, right? Like we're aloof to all the criticism, but we do feel it. Um, we know that there are places that we once enjoyed being, that we once frequented, but we no longer go around there anymore because there's some person or some group that we know what they think of us. And so we know we're not going to be welcome there and we're not going to get a fair hearing to change that opinion. And the other thing is that somewhere along the line, if we're honest, I think that a lot of us have begun to judge ourselves, right? Like we've opted in to this all-consuming game of judging. And because we judge, now we're sort of part of the problem. And that can be understandable. Like we can become subscribed to judgmentalism because judgmentalism is all we've received from others around us, right? Or we can begin to judge because maybe some of you have, you know, the voice of your inner critic is so harsh on yourself with this impossible standard that you're like, I'm being fair. I'm just judging everybody else the way that I judge myself. Like, I'm being as hard. No, one, no one's harder on me than I am. But however it is that we become subscribed to judgmentalism, we have to address it. Because just speaking from my own life and the pattern and the trajectory of my own decision-making and my own um, inner battles, when I've left judgmentalism to fester, it has resulted in my relationship suffering, and it sucks the joy from me. But there's a practical difficulty here in talking about uh, judgmentalism, and this is unavoidable. This is always part of the conversation, and it's, it's this reality that you and I have to make judgments all the time, right? We've already made judgments this morning. What we'd eat, what we'd wear, whether you would come to this service, if this hour would be worth your time. We've made a bunch of judgments already. And it's not just these impersonal decisions and judgments we make. No, we make judgment calls about other human beings all the time, right? Is this guy worth a second date? Is this applicant the right fit for this job? Uh, is this babysitter someone who I can trust with my child? right? And it doesn't work in any of those circumstances to just sort of throw up our hands and be idealistic and say, well, who am, who am I to judge? I don't want to be judgy. No, we have to make decisions. We have to show good judgment. And so part of the, the problem that we're looking at today is, is we're facing down this question, how do we show good judgment without becoming judgmental? How do we come show good judgment without being judgmental? And here's a great biblical inroad to this question. It comes from the prophet Zechariah. He says this, super underrated. Thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. See, I think what he's doing here is he's giving us a working definition of good judgment or true judgment according to God. And I don't think he's listing three commands, you know, show justice, mercy, kind. No, he's saying Show true judgment, and then he's defining it. He's saying true judgment in God's eyes is characterized by mercy and kindness. So in a sense, he's saying when we judge without showing mercy, we're never going to arrive at true justice. No mercy, no justice. And what a stark contrast this definition of judgment um, is compared to the judgment that we face all the time. See, what do we do when we usually judge? I think it's something like this process. We size people up. We sort them out. Oh, he's one of them. She represents that group. Well, I know, you know, that she knows this person, therefore she's associated with this. We sort people out, and then we write some off. Uh, we rank people. We assign them importance. And not only do we do this, but we rush through this process all the time, right? Sometimes it's just a single look, a single glance at someone, and we've rushed the judgment about them. Uh, if, if judgmentalism 
is something like a crushing gear that just crushes people, then the oil that greases those gears is assumptions. When we make assumptions, we rush to judgments, we hurt people. Okay, think about how social media feeds this drive. What are we doing on social media? When we're scrolling, what are we doing? Well, often, not always, but often, what we're doing is we are taking in minimal amounts of information and we are rushing to maximal judgments, right? We take in a single photo, a single tweet of X number of characters or less, and then we reach conclusions somehow about a person's character, about their family, about their faith. We rush to judgment. Or think about rush hour. Right? The judgments that we pass on other drivers, right? Uh, I, I remember several years ago, I was driving down Clovis Avenue on my way home, and, you know, it's bumper to bumper traffic, it's five o'clock, and all of a sudden, this maniac of a driver comes over from the rightmost lane, swerves over, nearly sideswipes the passenger side of my car where my beautiful wife is sitting, and as she does, she cuts us off, so I slam on the brakes, I lay on the horn, and in the moment, I give her a gesture to let her know exactly what I thought about this. And just as I do, and I realize what I'm doing, she makes this screeching hard left turn onto the freeway, and she turns over us at us with this sort of deer-in-the-headlights look, and I hear Delilah say, that's definitely my coworker." <laughs> just sort of like, really? And she's like, oh yeah, we definitely went to high school together. Like, I've known her for years. So, dead silence in the car. I, I feel my face getting red, instant regret. Delilah's over there, poor Delilah, having to text her friend to apologize for her pastor husband having done this, right? So I feel terrible, and then I get home, and I, I want to apologize, but the only way I know to do that is to look up this, <laughs> this person in Delilah's friends list on Facebook, and then you know when you're not friends with someone, so you have to direct message them, like, hey, uh, this is so-and-so um, about earlier. It's just terrible. And finally, in the end, when she did get back to me, she said, you know, the thing is, I had just gotten, I was driving home from the chiropractor because I have some neck issues that make it painful for me to turn my neck. That's why I didn't see you. So I just feel horrible. When we rush to judgments, we make fools of ourselves. That's what I did. So what do we do? How do we show true judgment Well, not rushing to judgment? Well, this morning, for the third week in a row, we're going to look to the book of James, okay? James is writing to an early Christian community whose practices reveal that their judgments have become warped. Prejudice has crept in to the people of God. When they gather together, uh, there's evidence that the well-dressed and the rich are being shown favoritism while the poor are being neglected. In other words, people's standing according to the values and hierarchy of the outside world is now being accepted and perpetuated within the Christian family. And James gets word of this and he writes to them to call them out on their judgment and to call them back to the way of Jesus. Beginning in chapter 4, verse 11. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. But there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? See, James is feisty, right? He comes out swinging. And what he says in this larger argument is a bit complex, but if we work backwards from that last mic drop of a question, it begins to make sense. New Testament theologian Scott McKnight translates the question in our modern language this way. He says what James is really asking us today is this, who in the world do you think you are to judge your neighbor? See, the Bible would tell us that the way that we judge others most often reveals the most about ourselves and our own issues. Even if we can't see it, others can, and our judgments reveal it. In their own eyes, James's readers are probably sitting there thinking, James, like, we're good people. Uh, we're not judgmental. Uh, we're faithful. We're part of the group that gets it. But James is pushing them and us towards self-reflection. So one of the best-selling books of, of 2019 last year was, was this one. It was Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers. And it was so cool because when this book came out, I saw people reading it, all kinds of people in coffee shops all over town, and I even caught Pastor John reading it, and then we both geeked out. Like, I grabbed my copy, like, oh my gosh, you too? And he's like, yeah, he's a genius. So we're reading this book, and people were fascinated with it because what, what Gladwell does in Talking to Strangers is he illustrates that in the judgments that we make about each other, we, we make judgments that are very, very messy, and we often misjudge. In fact, in many of 
the highest stakes moments, uh, the pivotal stories of recent history, we find out that there were times when everyone seemed to judge wrongly. And one of the reasons for this difficulty is something that is known to social psychologists as the illusion of asymmetric insight. I know that sounds fancy, right, because they have to get their research published, but what it really means is it's quite simple. You'll recognize it. The illusion of asymmetric insight is, quote, the conviction that we know others better than they know us, and that we may have insights about them that they lack, but not vice versa. And this leads us to talk when we would do well to listen and to be less patient than we ought to be when others express the conviction that they are the ones who are being misunderstood or judged unfairly. This is a humbling truth. This is just researchers concluding their research to say this, we naturally tend to overestimate the accuracy of our own judgments while underestimating the perspectives of others. So according to both James and Gladwell, if we want to show good judgment, a good first step is recognizing the limitations of our own insights. Like, you and I misjudge all the time. We mislabel, we miss important details. And I get it, we all like to think I'm a good judge of character, right? I like to think that, right? I like to think I'm a good judge of character. But James is saying when you're judging others, you're revealing something else about yourself. And he's asking us, who do you think you are when you're doing that? And now his argument goes a step further. It's this kind of layered argument because he's not just saying, uh, don't judge because when you judge, inevitably sometimes you'll get it wrong. No, he says this. Somehow, when we judge and condemn our neighbor, he says it's like we're judging and rejecting the law of God. Well, how does that make sense? Well, recall that last week, Pastor John, as he tackled um, the issues of religiosity, he summarized Jesus' teaching on the law to, summarize, to prioritize exactly two things, the love of God and the love of neighbor. So what James does is he continues Jesus' teaching to say, when we go around acting like we are judging on God's behalf, he says what you end up doing is you're not loving your neighbor and you're not loving God because your energies are being wasted playing God and judging your neighbor. In other words, to James, judgmentalism isn't this little sort of side issue that's like, well, you know, that's not a positive trait or whatever, it's not flattering, but no, James says, when we judge, we do something that runs against and counter to the good news of Jesus. He gives us two images that illustrate this point. The first is this. He's, he suggests that when we judge, it's like we stand above others. We're no longer focused on looking up to the law of God and aspiring to put it into practice. We're no longer looking to show kindness and mercy because instead, in our minds and hearts, we've put ourselves on a pedestal above the crowd. And now our posture, and I get it because I'm up on a stage, it's a little ironic, but our posture is that of, of standing over others and speaking down to them. And James stands back and he calls us to step off the pedestal. He says, who put you up there? And his argument continues with this even more powerful portrait. He says, in fact, when a person judges, it is as if he or she has climbed up into the very judgment seat of judgment seats, the throne of God itself. And it's like this comic picture of this tiny human sitting in the judgment seat of God and attempting to look out on the world and to judge it on their own, to do their best impersonation of God. James suggests that when we judge, we assume a role which is too big for us, and we assume a seat that's already taken. So, James goes on to say, there is a judge. And James says it's good news. He doesn't say there is no lawgiver and no judge. James says, no, there is a lawgiver and a judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. And this is good news. We don't often think of there being a judge and this being good news. Here's why it's good news. At least two reasons. The first reason is this. It means that for the wronged and the oppressed, there is the hope of justice. There is one who will make things right in the end. And it means this. It means that for all of the goodness and truth and beauty in the world that is so often overlooked and unthanked, that there will be one in the end who sees that and rewards it. There is one judge. But the good news is this. That judge is not you. And much better news, it's not me. 
In a deeper sense that we realize, uh, the old Tupac song is right, that, that refrain over and over, only God can judge me, right? I, I hear young people say this all the time. And what I've learned to ask is I just say, okay, th- there's a deep seat of truth to this and I want to validate them. And so what I've learned to ask is this, have you ever heard someone say, only God can judge me and then do something really positive? Like it's almost a contradiction in terms, right? Because what this line has come to mean is it's, it's us claiming a license for ourselves to do something that we sometimes know violates our better judgment. But what James is doing is he's kind of taking this truth and he's sort of flipping the coin over and if we would just do it with him, we would realize the more powerful truth is this. Only God can judge you. Only God can judge him, her, them. See, if we just suspended judgment, if we just backed off and withheld judgment for created space, how much goodness and kindness could God unleash? I heard this old story of a monastery um, where there were a bunch of Christian monks and they're living out in the desert. And apparently some brother there had committed a fault of some kind and this council is arranged to pass judgment on him and everyone is invited to join and they send out a summons for brother Moses to join, but he refuses. Until finally all the other monks say, we're all waiting here for you, like you're being disrespectful, you need to come. And only then does brother Moses arise and he comes to the council. But as he comes, he takes with him this leaking jug full of water. And as he comes... Um, these drops of their precious drinking water begin to drip into the hot desert sand and go to waste. And when the younger monks see him approaching and they realize what's happening, they run out to meet him and they say, Brother Moses, what are you doing? What have you done, Bob? And he says, ah, yes. And he turns and he looks at his tracks in the sand. He looks at all these drops of water and he says, my sin runs out behind me and I did not see it. Yet here I am on my way to judge the offenses of another. Supposedly, When they heard that line, they no longer said anything to the brother on trial, but released him. See, if we can just make space where we recognize how God has been merciful to us, it frees us up to receive and extend that mercy to others. Returning to James, uh, we find it right this. So speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. But mercy triumphs over judgment. See, I think that what James is doing, the foundation of his entire argument, is he's sitting there and he's thinking through the example of the life of Jesus. He's thinking about how when the only one with the right to judge came and lived among us, he not only chose to extend mercy rather than judgment, but he even handed himself over to be judged by others that they might receive mercy. And he's thinking about that. He's thinking about how the human judgment, our human judgment contempt him condemned him to death, but the judgment of God raised him from the dead. And he's thinking about this and thinking about this, and he's trying to put things together. And I, I imagine that this phrase just sort of erupts from within him as he reaches his grand conclusion, which is this. So then mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs. The word for triumph here um, in, the, in the ancient language is the, the same word that would be used for the gladiator as he or she would stand as the victor on the battlefield. And the image is is this that James is painting. James is saying, in the battle that Jesus has waged on our behalf so that we have new possibilities and new life and new hope, the dust has settled and mercy is the only one left standing in the arena. Mercy is what our hope is in. So what might it look like for mercy to triumph over judgment in our real world lives today? Well, I think I got a glimpse of this a few months ago. This bizarre encounter happened. I was out at a park in Sanger with one of my mentors, who's this older pastor, and we've been having this long conversation. We're sitting down on a park bench, and we were talking about some things of God and other things, and all of a sudden, um, this stranger kind of rolled up on his bike next to us, and he said, hey, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but I couldn't help but overhear what you guys have been saying, and I've got a couple questions. So like, of course, um, ask away. And so he and my mentor begin to exchange questions, and they're talking, they're having this good conversation. And then all of a sudden, he gets this weird look in his eyes, and he awkwardly pauses. He says, I've got another question. And he looks at us, and he says, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I just got out of prison. So I was wondering, if I showed up to your church, what would people think of me? 
And I looked up in the moment at this face of a stranger, and he's this tough dude. He's got tattoos peeking out all over the place. He's got a cut under one of his eyes that's a little swollen from this altercation he'd recently been in. And in the moment, I, I said the first thing I'd said in the whole conversation. I just said, you know, man, all I know is that Jesus himself was once a prisoner, and he told us that we're supposed to show God's kindness and mercy to those who are in prison and go and visit them because God cares for them. So I said, I think that's, that's all I can say. And when I said that, he sort of looked over at my, my older friend to kind of see, like, does that answer check out, right? My friend just nods. And then Mauricio sat down on the bench with us. And he began to tell his life story. And as he did, he did the most bizarre thing. In his backpack, he takes out this folder. And apparently, it was a folder that was filled with his files for an upcoming legal trial that he was going to be on. So it's got all sorts of stuff from his story in there. It's got arrest warrants. It's got documents of time served. It's got stuff on the custody battles that he's still in. It's got stuff on the GED that he just earned. And he's laying before us these papers as he tells us our story. And we have this long conversation. And at the end of it, we pray together. And there was this profound sense between the three of us that God was doing something in this moment. It's a beautiful, beautiful moment. And I hope that he's doing well this morning. I haven't seen him since. But I've been sort of reflecting um, on this moment ever since. And what really lasts for me and lingers is the question that he asks, what would people think of me? Because I think that's a question we ask, all of us, of one another. If I was honest with you, if I showed you some of the baggage that I'm carrying, what would you think of me? Would you judge me or could it be that you could extend something to me other than judgment? And, and just a layer deeper than that, I think, is the question he was asking both of us as he heard us talking about theology, which is this question. Could it be that there's a God who sees me as I really am and who loves me? So this morning, as I invite Noe and the band up here to, to close us off in worship, I want to just say this. Some of you may know that when Prodigal Church launched a couple years ago, I was not on staff um, but I was here the very first Sunday at Bullard High. I came with my wife just to check it out. I was pastoring at another church. And I came, and like many of you the first time, I came in about five minutes late, and we just shuffled in in the dark into a back seat way up there in the back of the theater, and we take in this whole worship service. And as we were driving home, it's that, that's that standard question of, you know, well, what do you think? And I remember that the first impression I ever had of this place, before I talked to Pastor John, before I met you, before I ever heard about our core values. I got this sense and I just told my wife, I said, I think that this is a place where our friends and family who are furthest from God and have been judged the harshest and the most unfairly by the church, I think that this is a place where they can come. See, that's the place that we want to be together as a church. We want to be a place where mercy triumphs over judgment. So I invite you to do this. Um, if you have a smartphone on you, as the band plays this last song, if you would take it out, and if you say, I'm done with this cycle of judging, I want to opt out, I want to step off the pedestal, I want to step away from the judgment seat, and I want mercy instead to reign in my life. I want mercy to reign in my marriage, in my family. And we're inviting you to just text one word. Just text the word judging, send it to this email address, prodigalunsubscribed at email.com. And this week, all you're going to get back is just some words from Jesus about mercy and judgment. Would you stand with me as we close our service? Jesus, thank you for being the one who is able to judge, and yet you turn out to be the one who extends mercy. Thank you for being a God who judges us not at our lowest points, but that you're a, a God that calls us to show mercy and compassion. God, help us this week um, that we would look to you, that we would know how you feel about us, that regardless of the way that others have judged us, God, that you would know, that we would know that you see us as we are and you love us all the same. God, forgive us for the way that we judge others and lead us this week to practice mercy and kindness. In Jesus' name, amen.